explain that. Then I'll be presenting our first two points. First, looking at the nature of this culture of violence, what it really means, what we're talking about today, and why that's a obviously bad thing. Then second, I'm going to be going over why this culture is a direct and most important threat, the most serious threat to sustainable development. And then our second speaker, Austin, is going to be presenting our third point, which is talking about the nature of control and why there's no incentive for this culture to stop. So let's start then really with our model and framework today, which is looking at what are we talking about essentially today. Let's start with sustainable development. Now we want to look at what the UN defines sustainable development as. We think that this is pretty reasonable. The UN says three foundations for human development are to live a healthy and creative life, to be knowledgeable, and to have an access to resources needed for a decent standard of living. And so we think that this is important because we want you to take note that sustainable development isn't just GDP. It's not just money. No, what we're looking at and what we specifically think the UN does well in defining sustainable development is that it's this cohesive principle. It's looking at not just that economic reform, but all of human development, getting that knowledge, having a healthy and creative life, and having access to those resources. Let's look at what the most serious threat is. And today, what we want to do in talking about what this uh, part of the motion means is essentially point out to you today that in this debate, we're not supposed to be having a debate about, okay, what specific policies or measures should the government pass tomorrow? No, we're not saying, okay, there's all these problems in society, and what we want to do is pass this regulation right away. So first off today, we're not talking about what regulations do we need to pass right away. We actually say to you that, okay, Governments can solve other problems while they're solving the culture of violence and even before they solve the culture of violence. Because in general, what we're talking about today with this idea of the most serious threat is simply that this is a threat that's inevitably going to halt sustainable development in these countries. We're not trying to convince you or today have a debate about what policies should be passed right away. Then let's finally move on to talking about what the culture of violence is. It's really the most important distinction to make here is we're not just talking about individual instances of blatant violence against women, which of course is bad and happens, but we're talking about an actual culture, an actual mindset, an actual framework in society which is ambivalent to these problems, which allows this to happen in societies and cultures in which they actually create legislation, they create policies that allow the culture of violence to continue and to persist. Let's move on then, right before this, I'll get to your question, to so looking at the burdens. All right, so your definition of the sustainable development, it sounded like your definition was just focusing on the present, but what about the sustainable part? You would agree that we have to look at the future as well. I mean, yeah, that's literally the definition of sustainable development. It says we're looking at how to create a healthy and creative life. Obviously, that's not something that's short-term. We're looking at how to have knowledge, how to have access to resources for standard of living. So, yeah, the UN, obviously, they're not talking about short-term solutions. It's long-term solutions. And the really only burden that we want to talk about before I get to our points today is that as the proposition team, we're going to be proving how sustainable development is unachievable without addressing the culture of violence. Let's move on then, first off, to looking at the nature of the culture of violence. And the first point we want to talk about, the first analysis that we want to make under this, is that obviously there's a blatant culture of violence. There's things like genital mutilation, rape, sexual and human trafficking. There's things that are just blatant violence against women that happen and that are going on in this culture. But the second point of analysis that we want to make under this is that, okay, first off, there is this blatant culture of immediate and direct violence that's a threat. But then we also want to look at how not only is there this, but there's also societal structures which allow this culture to persist and which allow this culture to keep going. There's legislations that are passed, things like rape laws, which essentially <coughs> make it to where it's either the woman's fault to be raped or make it to where she has a fear of reporting rapes because she fears retaliation, because she fears punishment. We think that even laws like that go under the culture of violence because this culture of violence is essentially about a mindset. And even if there's laws that, okay, obviously a law probably isn't going to directly be uh, physically harmful to someone, we say that when these laws allow physical and bodily harm to happen, they're contributing more to the culture of violence. 
So we think that the impact of this simply just by looking at the nature of the culture of violence is that first off, there's this blatant culture of violence, there's these blatant acts which are very bad, which happen all throughout society. And then we think that further, there's this mindset throughout society, there's societal structures that exist that allow the violence to continue. And we think that the culture is a mindset that's continuing. So let's then move on to our second substantive, because honestly, there doesn't really, and probably hopefully won't be that much contention about whether or not the culture of violence exists. But what our second point does is it shows you why then is this culture of violence a direct and most serious threat to sustainable development. And we tell you that human development, obviously, it's not just about GDP. It has to do with human feeling, consciousness, education, quality of living conditions. And we think that sustainable development is this ever-present march, if you will, as humans to realizing the perfect human condition and quality of living. And so we think that the opposition probably will, too, talk about a lot of problems that exist within society. Things like meeting basic needs, getting food, water. And we think that the difference, though, and the reason why the culture of violence is a direct threat to sustainable development is because it has unique problems. Because we think when you look at these millions of other problems in society, that there's a vested interest by the majority in society to solve these problems. We think that there's a vested interest in people making profitable and good solutions to this. But we think that when you look at the culture of violence, that the culture of violence, there's no vested interest by the majority of society in solving it because it actually threatens the chauvinist patriarchy. We think that it's unprofitable for people to give up their control and to give up the culture of violence, which is what our second speaker goal is going to be talking about. So we think in this case then, that even if society could have infinite goods, infinite access to services, if it could have infinite food, we think that when there's still cultures of violence, that development has not been achieved. Because we think that development, as we talked about, is realizing this human condition, realizing quality of living. And we think that when we live in a world in which women are severely dehumanized, we think that whenever they're blatantly killed and whenever there's a mindset which says that this is okay, whenever there's societal structures which allow these things to happen, we say that that's going to be inevitably the most serious threat to the sustainable development of our world. Thank you. Of violence. 
I want to settle this debate under the subpoena of one. We absolutely agree with our entire subpoena of one that the nature of the culture of violence is something that has to be dealt with. This is not a debate about whether it's good or bad, as we would like you to believe under substantive one. Their substantive one really doesn't have a lot of weight in today's debate realm. The most weight it has is under substantive two, when they talk about it's the most serious threat. And I'll be spending the majority of my time under, under their case on this point. I have a couple responses. They, their overall analysis it says because this is a unique problem and because we do not have a vested interest in solving this problem, therefore it is the most serious threat. A couple responses. Uniqueness does not equal the most serious threat. Just because something is a unique threat does not mean it is the most serious threat towards a society. In fact, generally, the more attention someone puts on a subject, the more important they believe that subject to be. But as a whole, I think the majority of people actually want to solve the culture of women, uh, the culture of violence against women. I think everyone in this room wants to solve this problem. We do have a vested interest. We do want to solve this problem. But that's not what we're debating about today. What we're supposed to be debating about is whether or not it is the most serious threat. And the only one that they have given to you in the first speech is that it has unique problems. They never discussed exactly what those unique problems were without any detailed analysis. But let's, let's move on into our own case. Now, I'm going to be presenting one substantive discussing how there are greater threats to sustainable development, and my partner will be bringing up our second substantive discussing how violence against women does not prevent sustainable development. Well, let's go over some general burdens so we understand what the actual grounds are for today's debate. Now, the proposition burden they must prove that there is not a single issue that is a bigger threat to sustainable development than the culture of violence against women. That is their burden set forth in the very terminology and wording of the motion. Yes. Back to your definition, since this is the first time we've got this information. Um, you were talking basically about resources and access to resources, but this doesn't address overall human well-being and consciousness and quality of life. It just addresses money, food, and water, right? Like we said, this is not a counter-definition. We like your definition. The only thing is there is no future aspect, and I think that needs to be clarified. We're okay with the stuff that they brought up under their definition, but we just want to make sure for everybody on the panel that we are discussing present issues without forgetting the future issues. That is the whole reason why we brought up this clarification point in the first place. So let's move on to the opposition burden, our burden as the opposition team. We must prove that there is one single issue that is more threatening than the proposition side. So let's go over our first statement, discussing how there are greater threats to sustainable development. While we do agree that violence against women is a threat, there are more serious threats towards sustainable development. We are going to be explaining this substantive through a five-point star. We will be looking at five threats that are more serious threats than a culture of violence towards women. Our five points are as follows. Climate change, involuntary migration, poverty, hunger, and political instability. Now the star itself, we can write in the middle of the star, is sustainable development. So if you want to, please write out a five-point star and draw on each tip of the star our five points. This is a great illustration to help you remember what exactly we stand for. Let's move on into our first point about climate change. Now because of increased warming and temperatures, there has led to a decreased amount of rainfall. Now the problem with the decreased amount of rainfall is an increased number and severity of droughts. Now by 2025, 2.8 billion people will experience water scarcity. The current situation in 2017 is 1 1.6 billion now. That's an increase of 1.2 billion people lacking the necessary resource, the very essence of life, water, to survive. This threatens sustainable development because the future of society is at risk for two reasons, really. Because without water, we have serious health risks for the population. And from an economic perspective, through the example of crops, if we do not have sufficient water to water our crops, the food industry as well will be hurt. Our second point is involuntary migration. Now, involuntary migration is being forced to migrate from one country to another because of things such as a lack of resources or war. 60 million people in 2015 were forced to migrate to another country. This, this threatens sustainable development because when those millions go to new countries, there will be less overall resources available, such as education, 
hospitals, water, and food supplies. Why? Because when millions more, 60 million people are spread out among different countries, those countries' resources are taken a strain, and this harms sustainable development. Our next point is on poverty. When people do not have enough money to live, it affects sustainable development because people's needs in the present and the future are not met. 1.3 billion people live on less than one US dollar per day. Unless there's a dramatic change, there will be a continuous cycle of people being born into poverty, and unless there is some dramatic change, this continuous cycle work will occur. And the reason why we're discussing this in the first place is because poverty lowers the standard of living, which has direct effects on sustainable development. The next issue is hunger. Because in the early stages of human development, food is incredibly important. In the first two years of life, 70% of your brain develops. If the young child experiences severe hunger, irreversible damage will happen. Because of this underdevelopment of both their body and their brain, the, their earning capacity will actually be reduced by 22%. How is this the case? Because when there is severe, because when there are severe shortages in food, what happens is your brain, your cognitive ability is, is underdeveloped. So you will be you are less likely to get a job in the current system. Let's look at our last point of political instability. A lack of rule of law opens up abuse to everyone, not just women. All of the proposition impacts that apply towards women can apply to everyone on the rule of law. Because the rule of law is supposed to establish justice. And with an unstable justice system, everyone can be abused. So an unstable rule of law abuses everyone, not just women. Thank you, and I urge you to be voting for the opposition. Future. However, in a point of information, we agreed that we are talking about the future and our definition does line up. 
However, their definition doesn't really make a lot of sense because their definition is limited to specifically natural resources, things like the money, food, water, etc., and leaves out that cultural mindset that we're talking about and a lot of other things that we talk about in the definition being a healthy and creative life and being knowledgeable, access to resources, etc. So we want to be able to make sure that, that that sustainable development that we're talking about isn't just whether or not people can get money and food, but ultimately whether or not they can be healthy, knowledgeable, etc. throughout the entirety of society. Now, uh, yes, your question. Okay, you were talking about how they have to have a healthy life, being knowledgeable, and an education. Can you adequately have all of those things if you do not have any resources? No, so of course resources are important. We're simply saying your definition is exclusive to resources, and so that shouldn't be the definition that we ultimately stand on. Our definition is all encompassing of everything as a part of society. Now, the next thing they talked about is that uh, everybody, uh, everyone wants to solve that everybody in this room probably wants to solve the culture of violence against women. And while that may be true, the point that we're bringing up as team proposition is the fact that even though a lot of people may want to solve the problem, not a lot is being done. And I'm, I'm going to be talking about in my speech why there's really not an incentive uh, a little bit later on to solve it, even if there's some general big idea that it's bad. Now, they also talk about the burdens, that it's our burden to prove that there is no other bigger issue. And that's simply what the motion is, so I agree. Now, their, their one point that they brought up in their speech was talking about other threats to sustainable development. And all of these threats have the same responses. First of all, there's an incentive to solve these problems because of the fact that everyone has a vested interest. When you look at things like climate change, involuntary migration, poverty, hunger, and political instability, everyone is being negatively affected, and everyone, therefore, uh, has, the, has the incentive to solve that problem. We see programs being set up all around the world to solve those problems because everyone is being negatively impacted, and just given time, they can be solved through economics. The problem is that the culture of violence against women is not something that's just solvable by economics. It's actually a cultural mindset that has to be changed, and that's why it's the most serious threat. I'll be elaborating on that in my point in just a moment. But the biggest issue here is that, once again, there has been absolutely no comparison between these five points they brought up and our point against the culture of violence. So right now, once again, we have a lot of threats to sustainable development and no analysis by team opposition. And so I'm going to be providing that for you today. Let's look at why the culture of violence is the most serious. With our third point, the, the nature of control. Now, the nature of control is essentially the fact that the thing that's restraining sustainable development isn't inherently solely the physical acts of violence in other countries, but the cultural acceptance of the idea that women are inferior, and that's just the way it is. See, what they brought up in their first speech was, once again, that quote saying that, well, everybody wants to solve this problem. However, that cultural mindset saying that, well, that's just the way it is, we think it's bad, but we're not doing anything to solve it, and that's the real problem, why it's the most dangerous and too sustainable development. See, right now, men are benefited by this cultural violence, that cultural acceptance saying that women are inferior. They're, based on the country and the economics, etc., there's always some sort of a benefit that men are getting. Either sexual gratification, a scapegoat for mistakes, where examples like my partner Madison brought up of rape being blamed exclusively on the woman is possible. Men oftentimes have the easier life being able to be CEOs of these large corporations and can avoid the smaller, dirtier work. And especially in developing countries, we have a lot of instances where men have the economic control because of the fact that they're controlling the money and controlling the, the travel, etc. We can look to kind of the cryptic of the situation in Saudi Arabia, for example, when women's income and women's travel rights are exclusively controlled by their husbands and by their fathers. And so the men kind of have the ability to, uh, to have the, the economic control of the situation because they get to control where people go and where the money goes. Except your question, speaking of the cryptic of the situation, you were talking about how no one wants to try and stop essentially this violence. Uh, can you explain to me how the women's movement explains that? Sure, so there are people that want to stop the violence. However, I'll be talking just further on into this point, how because of the fact that men are benefited and don't want to give up their power, uh, that there's not a huge incentive for it to be solved. They're the ones in the power, and they're not just going to give it up freely. But let's continue. We see the, the extreme examples in Saudi Arabia of economic control. But we also see, even in fully developed countries like the United States of America, that two out of every three rapes go unreported because of that cultural violence that we see in the United States, where rape laws, etc., prohibit people or disincentivize people from reporting the rapes in the first place. That culture of violence isn't solved even when the, the uh, economy itself becomes improved. 
Now, we see that it would be absurd, absurd to assume that, that these men are just going to automatically deny their, their power, deny that benefit uh, for no particular reason. Because people's dominance or superiority, the men in this instance, don't just give that up arbitrarily because benefits happen to arise. That's why you see in America, there is still a culture of violence against women, even though we have a decent economy. Now, we see that the team proposition needs to show that this power is going to be given up voluntarily. Otherwise, it's logical to infer that this culture will remain a looming disease until it's intentionally changed. The problem is that when we look at all the other examples that we've seen throughout the speech, what we're, what we're looking at are things like hunger, starvation, lack of water, etc., where everybody has a vested interest, and at a given time, it's going to be changed economically. The problem is that a culture of violence against women is specifically referring to the, the cultural acceptability, where it's an acceptance saying that that's just the way it is, and it's never going to be changed. Because of the fact that half of the population has a vested interest in keeping this oppression of women, even in developing countries, there's no way that it's ever going to be solved, making it, therefore, the most serious threat to sustainable development. Because if you if you uh, never solve women's if you never solve this culture of violence against women, you will always have new problems coming up that are directly reflecting upon that issue. In Saudi Arabia, you have problems of actual physical violence and rape, etc., that are considered acceptable. But even in America, where they've had years to develop and they've fixed their small problems, they still have that looming presence of the violence against women in their, in their rape laws, etc., which makes it an underlying core principle problem that's built into their foundation and is ultimately continuing to make them stumble uh, until they can solve that problem. But the problem is there's not an incentive for half of the population to solve the problem because they have a vested interest and are benefiting. The men are getting to sit up in their high CEO positions, they're getting to have easy lives, economic control, etc. And there's obviously no way that they would just give that up because it gives them a good life. So the, the team proposition needs to prove that there's some way that just through economics or, or some arbitrary way, men will decide one day to give up their run, give up that power. Otherwise, it still remains the most serious threat. The most serious threat is the one that won't be solved. And that's exactly what we're showing, is that the culture of violence against women won't be solved given the current circumstances. Uh, 
again. I would like to bring up, we didn't actually bring out their counter definition. We actually accept their definition. However, we do want to point out that we must focus on the future. Now, the reason resources are so important is when we actually look at their definition, they didn't say the word resources, but when you say healthy and creative life, well, can you have a healthy life without food? No, we need resources for that. Do we have knowledge without resources to build up schools? No, we need resources for that. And their final goal, a decent standard of development. Can you have development without resources? No. So we absolutely see that resources are at the core of that issue, although there are three different, more broader issues to illustrate that. Now the next argument, they were saying that not a lot is being done when we said that the majority of the people want to solve this problem. Now, the response to this is to start off with they have a change in stance. They started out around saying that uh, no one wants to solve this problem, that's why it's an issue. Now they're saying, well, there's not a lot of progress on the solving of the issue, that's why it is the most serious threat. So they changed their stance to begin with. Now our response to this is not a lot is not a lot of progress is being made on the other five issues that we brought up. Yeah, people are concerned because they are serious threats. But are we close to solving poverty? No. Are we close to solving climate change? Absolutely not. So we see that people do understand that these are threats, and yes, people are actively working towards this because the entire world agrees that these are serious threats to sustainable development, but we're making the same amount of progress or lack thereof on all these different issues. Now the next argument they were discussing is that uh, the culture of violence is the most serious. Underneath this, they said that not a single person is trying to solve. We already discussed how that's false and the point of information. Why do we have feminism if no one wants to solve this? I'm pretty sure a lot of people in this room also want to solve that culture of violence against women. So we can see that that's false. Underneath that, they also said that half the population has a vested interest in keeping this culture. Now, maybe about 50% of the people in this room are guys, and I want to ask you, do you guys really want this culture of violence against women? I think everyone in here does not have a vested interest in keeping this culture of violence against women. That's absolutely false. You say that half of the It's possible that part of the population in these really bad countries with horrible political systems with bad like, political instability, yeah, sure, there are some guys in there who are really messed up and like this culture of violence against women. It's false to say that half the population does. Now the next argument that they were discussing is that how this culture of violence won't be solved. Uh, the, our response to this is that neither will the other problems. Neither will the other five problems that we brought up. They were saying again and again that this culture of violence is the most serious threat because nobody wants to solve it and it will never be solved. Well our response is first off, lots of people want to solve it. Also lots of people want to solve these other issues but the other issues are more of a threat, which we're about to get into. So why is it that the other issues are more of a threat? Now the first layer of analysis is how these other issues actually cause a culture of violence against women. Now I'm not going to make a blanket statement, of course not, but to start out with, it's generally less likely for a man to be abusive towards his wife if he's in a good position with a good economic stability and generally doing well in life. But when you do have poverty, you do have political instability, you have all these other problems, you have hunger, you have starvation, when you're in that sort of a bad situation, that's when it's going to be more likely to have this culture of violence against women. So we see that these five different issues that we were discussing actually play into the culture of violence against women. But to, we're going to go first through the second period of how the violence against women does not prevent sustainable development, and then maybe go into a bit more analysis on the five different issues that are actually more serious threats. Why are they more serious threats? Well, because violence against women is inherently limited to 50%. Even assuming it's right across the entire world and every single woman was subject to this culture of violence against women, it's absolutely impossible to go past 50%. Now, why is that important? Well, because the other five issues are not limited at all. The other five issues we're talking about are more serious threat because they are not limited at all to the rest of the population. Yes. Don't you think that the problem, though, is that specifically with the culture of violence, there's actually a mindset that enforces it and reinforces the thinking bar as with the other issues? They simply just have the other understand. So the problem with the culture of violence, yes, it's the mindset. So there are other causes for those other different five issues. So climate change, that's caused by different things. So culture violence is caused by a mindset. That's an issue. Political instability is caused by a 
development. Now let's keep going into how the violence against women does not prevent sustainable development. Again, we're saying violence against women is a really bad thing, but it's simply factually <coughs> not true to say that it's the most serious threat. Because it's inherently, inherently limited, even in the worst cases, there still is sustainable development. Now we've seen why that's true because it's inherently limited, but now let's look at some real world applications to some real world illustrations. We see in the country of Mali, they have some of the worst abuses against women worldwide. The female life expectancy in Mali is 48 years. That's one of three countries in the entire world where the life expectancy for women is lower than that of men. We understand that for women in Mali, they are at a, in a horrible situation. But what do we see? That although there is a horrible situation, Mali's economy is doing great. Their country is doing great. I'm not saying their women are okay or that their women aren't actually being, are actually suffering. I'm saying that's a huge problem and yet they still have sustainable development. They're still able to have healthy lives. They have enough resources. In fact, Mali's GDP is at a 6.1% growth rate. And not only talking about the economy, also talking specifically about sustainable development and enabling development in the future, the Malayan Agency for Environment and Sustainable Development has ensured greening process embedded in the national coordination mechanism. They specifically have things working for sustainable development. It's a horrible country, horrible for women, and yet they have sustainable development. The reason for that is because violence against women is inherently limited. And it's unable to be a the most serious threat to sustainable development. Just not that. 
We're not going on a numbers game here. We're going on what actually is human development. And human development is not having plenty of money, but a culture that condones rape, that culture that condones violence, a culture that at least tacitly or approves it in hindsight. With that, let's look at the idea of economic development. So what they tell us is that there's all of these problems, most of them actually stemming from the economy. In fact, all of them can actually be causally linked to economic growth. And while that is true, and while their second substance is talking about how Mali improved economically, but they still have dehumanizing conditions because of the culture of race and violence, yet they achieve sustainable development is flat wrong. They are not, they do not have sustainable development because their culture of violence remains. Like in Saudi Arabia, which is a very, very rich country, or at least has the potential to be, it doesn't matter when you have to get permission to leave the country from your husband, or when you have to get permission to go outside, or when you get raped and you get punished for it. That's not sustainable development. That isn't human advancement. That isn't a perfection of quality of life. Yes. So you're talking about two-thirds of rape is unreported in the United States. So are you saying that the United States is not sustainable? Absolutely. Sustainable development has not been achieved in the United States. Sure, we've got a lot of money and a lot of power, but ultimately, our society is broken because we have a great Nowhere do we have a country that does not have a rape problem. And while that is an extreme and scary statement to make, it is true. Because what side opposite, we're promoting this, this mindset that side opposition is saying that they're sweeping all of the problems under the economic rug. Why? Because that's an easy problem to solve. We make more money. We improve governance. We do more scientific research. All of those are solvable problems that literally every human on Earth wants to solve. No one wants us all to die from climate change. Okay? That's a solvable problem. However, there are millions of people who have a vested interest in oppressing women even if it's just one country, that culture remains. Let's talk about political development, because they tell us that this is a big problem. And yet, who wants political instability? No one profits from chaos and war. Even the most horrible dictator wants their country to be stable, and they want themselves to be in power. Political instability can be solved, will be solved, ultimately. When we look at sort of an eternal perspective in the next couple thousand years, we can solve all of these issues. Poverty, while yes, we're not a year away from a solution, we have solutions that are in place. And even with the most horrible governance, those impoverished countries are still doing better thanks to globalization, thanks to just general technological advancement, thanks to improvements in access to resources. And while side opposition says, exactly, access to resources, therefore they're happier. No one is happier when two-thirds of rapes go unreported. We don't have an instance where you're actually a, you've achieved human development. We can't achieve human development without ending this culture of violence. Let's move on to the social problem. Now, what side opposition tells us is, well, this will all be solved when we have more money. Absolutely not, because men's mindsets have to change. And what side opposition tells us is, okay, so no one in, most of us, probably all of us in here, are not rapists. So therefore, we don't have a problem, right? Isn't that right, everyone? We don't have a problem, <laughs> because none of you are bad people. Yet that's faulty logic by saying, oh, well, none of us have a problem, and therefore there isn't a problem. Yet they don't analyze the argument, their substantive uh, argument talking about the nature of control that says men have a vested interest in power. The human brain is wired to control other people. We desire power over other people, be it finances be it sexual power, be it uh, just general control over their actions. That's the problem that we have, and that's the problem that remains, even if we achieve every other human development goal of the United Nations. And we can, because they are solvable issues. Let's move on. Uh, so that brings us essentially to the second clash. Opposition tells us all these problems, and yet they ignore the argument that society has an incentive to solve all of these problems. The first rule of human action is that people respond to incentives. And we all want to solve these issues. Not only one, because it's economically profitable, therefore achieving the opposition's goal, but two, because we're all going to die without it. We don't all die if the culture of violence against women continues. That is true. We don't all die. But 
what is almost worse than death and might be worse than death. It's telling you that it's your fault that violence was done against you. Telling you that it's your fault that ultimately this violence exists. Telling you that it's your fault that you cannot go to the authorities and report this. That is deadly and it is insidious and it should never be promoted or allowed or condoned. With that, let's move on to the third problem and that, or the third class, and that is the solution. The solution is this. Men have to change, which, as most married women will understand, is impossible. <laughs> it's not going to happen on its own. And that's because it is deep psychological change that hungers for power. And sure, we're not all bad people. Not every man is a horrible chauvinist. But we do have this issue that society is ignoring, or at least sweeping under the economic rug, promoting the mindset that side opposition wants you, wants to, <coughs> you to leave. Because the solvable issue, side opposition wants to focus on the economic issues, and that's what business leaders want to focus on, that's what gets leaders reelected into power. Talking about the rape problem in society doesn't get you elected to the presidency or the prime ministership or anything. And that is exactly why it's the most serious threat, because it will not be solved unless we're trying to change something that's very, very difficult to be solved. Thank you very much. development. 
but rather what practically achieves that. And so that's what we have to look at today. Because what he stated was that it is not a numbers game. And while people are not just numbers, that's not technically true. It is in some way a numbers game. Hypothetically, if cultural violence against women, again, this is not the case whatsoever, that's not what I'm saying, only hurt one person, but these problems hurt hundreds of thousands, that is technically a numbers game because we are looking at what practically affects sustainable development. And when we look at things like health, we can determine how many people are healthy, how many people have higher living standards. That is in some way a numbers game. Again, people are not numbers. Every single person is important, but we have to look at what actually numerically benefits sustainable development because we are on some level dealing with resources and dealing with health, all of which have previously and can be numerically defined. That is how we determine which policies are best and which problems are the biggest threat. That's how the United Nations did it, and that's why the culture of violence against women, while important, was not number one on the list and why it was only a sub-point. Now, they also talked about, essentially, uh, the definition of, uh, they, again, kind of define themselves almost a win without analysis because they said that Mali does not have sustainable development because they have a culture of violence and yet never explained how the culture of violence inherently made sure there was no sustainable development. Giving them those resources, they literally had a program ensuring environmental sustainable development, so I'm not really sure how they could say that was not sustainable development. They gave you no reason. They just said, well, our side is culture of violence, and so therefore it doesn't work. But gave you no real analysis to say why Mali does not have sustainable development. Their GDP is increasing at about three times the rate of a country like the United States. And I'm not disagreeing whether or not the United States or really any country is complete sustainable development, but it's something that we are working towards. And so a threat against that is something that hurts sustainable development, not necessarily the opposite being solving. Now the second issue is dealing with whether or not the cultural violence can be solved because they essentially claim that because it's a cultural problem, men won't change and so nothing's going to happen. However, this is flawed in the fact that men won't change, maybe in marriages, sure that's the case, but ultimately people do change. In Saudi Arabia, an example where they gave where women were hurt significantly, women just received the ability to vote and have been elected to local and federal levels. That proves men are working at supporting women completely through their ideas that no men want to change, no men want to support women. That is a factually false statement. And are asking you people whether or not you wanted the culture of violence to continue was not to do that to say you should vote for us because of that, but to say they cannot make a claim that no men or no no one wants to solve this problem because that is factually false. This is a problem and people want to solve it, but that is inherently not what this debate round is about. It is whether or not it impacts sustainable development more. And I'll talk about how the cycles of poverty are the exact same of a cycle of culture. And we'll address this later, but before I get that, I can answer your question. Sure, so you talk about Saudi Arabia where women have positions of authority. You can even look to the United States where women have positions of authority, and yet the two-thirds ratio of rape that goes unreported is still in the society. That's true, but we're debating whether or not people want to change and support women, so that isn't reviewing anyway what I was stating, is that men are willing to change, and men are willing to support women, but they're saying because some men don't, then all men don't, and that is a factually false statement. Now the next thing we have to talk about is the root causes, because what we talk about is there are root causes to this culture of violence, and those are the more important issues. Those are the higher threats, such as a lack of resources, poverty, hunger, political instability. Those things cause these women to have to possibly involuntary migrate. It causes their husbands to have more stress and lead them to the point of beating or attacking or violence against women. Now, I'm not making a stereotype statement that all poor men beat their wives, but that all rich men do not. But rather, it is factually false that the more stress you have because of the lack of resources, that leads to a greater level of violence. And so there are root causes of this, like political instability, like hunger, and that is why they are a greater threat. It's because when you address those issues, you address the culture of violence and more. And that is what we are getting at. It's not that the culture of violence is not important, but if we can address a threat that has includes the culture of violence, among other things, that is where we get into the idea of a more serious threat. Now the third issue we have to talk about is whether or not the five issues can be solved, and they really only addressed two in the last week. They said political instability can be solved and that poverty solutions are in place. And my response to both of these, if that's the case, then why in thousands of years have none of them been fixed? He said, in the next thousand years, political instability could go away. I mean, hypothetically, but in the past thousand years, that has not been the case, and we have no reason to believe that would change, because people will always be rising up for power and wanting that 
power. And when that happens, political instability will continue. And so they cannot say it will just be solved in a thousand years, so it's not important. Because honestly, we could say the same thing about the nature of violence against women. Hypothetically, it could happen. Now, of course, I don't think either team believes any of these issues will just be solved inherently in the future, but rather that both of them can be solved, the question of which of them provides a greater threat. Now, the reason we believe that these five issues, things like climate change, like involuntary immigration, <coughs> poverty, hunger, and political instability are a greater threat is because of the amount of people affected necessarily. Is that the culture of violence against women, they never responded to the fact that only affects 50% of the population at its worst case scenario. That can be true, but that's not what's happening right now because we already clarified 50% of women are not actually violence against every single day or even every year, and so that's actually false. But on the issue, even if it was 50%, every single issue listed by the opposition team can affect 100% of the population. The problem with their side is it's limited to a group of people, while the issues we brought up are not. If you have climate change that creates poverty, everyone can be affected by poverty. Everyone can be affected by hunger. Everyone can be affected by involuntary migration, political stability, and climate change, and yet the culture of violence against women only affects them. And I know it sounds bad to say that, and my goal here is not to say that it is not important, because time and time again, we have told you it's important. We have told you we do not want that. What we have also told you is that what is necessary is to focus on the highest threat. And something that can destroy 100% of the population is more important than something that can destroy the majority. Resources. 
If you want to use their definition as a weighing mechanism, which side best holds today's motion, by their own definition, they have not shown you how the culture of violence fits and clashes with that specific definition in America. That's all that we're asking for as team opposition, to link the definition to their motion and to their example. Because that example has not been properly linked to the motion, we ask you to disregard it. So let's look at another example under this, underneath this case. We believe America has, needs cultural development, not sustainable development. Those are the two main differences here. Are we talking about cultural development with a cultural issue or a sustainable development problem with a development issue? We have to be very clear to show the bright lines. I want to point out one of the biggest flashes, the biggest flash points in today's great job. What is the root of the culture of violence? What is the actual issue behind this entire debate? And what Noah pointed out in his last speech was very clear. Things like hunger and poverty and overall struggle really do increase the acceptability and incentive to hurt someone else. Because we as humans sometimes don't want to accept that bad things are happening, so we have to deal with it. We have to put it on someone else. We have to blame someone else. And a lot of times, men blame their overall struggles on another person, in this case, the woman. We're not saying this is a good thing. We're saying the five problems that we mentioned are oftentimes the root of the culture of balance. Because there are issues in society that cause people to struggle, they have to take it out on some other person. This is the lot that we've been bringing up throughout today's debate. Let's examine a worst case and best case scenario for the opposition. The worst case for the opposition is that the culture of violence against women is an equal point on our five-point star. Maybe we have to morph into a six-point star. Maybe it is as equal of a problem as all of those other things, because we know all those other things have not been solved in the, in the last 1,000 years like they would want me to believe. That is the worst case scenario, that it is on an equal ground as the opposition's problems that we've mentioned. But the best case scenario, that does not include under the equalness, that does not show it's the most serious threat. So even under the worst case of the opposition, we should still win today's debate round because it would be on an equal footing, not the most serious threat. Thank you for your time. Thank you. 
But we say on private side proposition, our problem is greater because not only would we have to pass government regulation to fix this, but we actually have to change the societal structure. We have to change the mindset and the personal beliefs held by people. We have to change this mindset and this culture that reinforces that these things happen and is ambivalent towards them. That's why we say it's a more serious threat. And finally, we talk about the nature of control, how people and power have no incentive to give it that culture of violence when it gives them control over people. They simply said, well, yes, but there's other issues. And that simply just doesn't cut it today. Because we've seen those other issues, those can and eventually will be solved. We're not saying, yeah, they're going to be solved tomorrow. We're saying ultimately they can be because people think it's a good idea and people can do that through regulation. But on our side, it's much harder. It's much more difficult, which is what we actually see in the world. That's what makes it a more serious threat. Now, at the end of today, we look to the models. And side opposition has kind of tried to say that this is a definition debate over sustainability, but we believe it's greater than that. We believe that side opposition is directly reinforcing the problem that we find in our world. That development is just the economy. Development is just resources. But we tell you that this isn't true. That sustainable development is that, but it's more. That's what we tell you in our first speech. That's what we said this entire debate round. It's about human health. It's about knowledge. It's about basic rights. And they say, well, look at places like the US. This is what proves our side on truth. They say the US has lots of underreported rates. That's a bad thing. But then they say they're still sustainably developed because they're rich. We say, no. This is the exact mindset which makes it the most serious threat. That just because you have a rich country, when you have women who fear that if they report a rape, they're going to be punished, or they fear that nothing will get done, they fear retaliation, we see that reinforcing that mindset, that destroys sustainable development. Because we say sustainable development is more than that. It's about having this basic human health, basic human rights. And the most serious threat to that is a mindset and a society which says that, okay, you know, as long as that happens, that's just kind of what happens, and we can develop without it. But we say no. When it directly threatens people who are in power and they have no incentive to change, it is the most serious threat to their sustainable development.